uh, my uh, great pleasure today to introduce uh, Tim Brooks, who is going to talk to us about endangered alphabets. Uh, I know that when you're a good host, you have to say that you're pleased to welcome the person, but I am truly pleased today because <laughs> Tim Brooks is a, a famous writer, uh, so he's well, according to the Goodreads, your Goodreads page <laughs> tells me that you're famous. You've got some very nice, numerous nice uh, commentaries on that page. So Tim Brooks is a British writer, but he lives in the United States. Uh, he has written an impressive number of books. So again, according to the Goodreads uh, page, it's more than 20 books. 16. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there were some books on how to use the iPhone 7. I didn't think that was you. I thought that was another <laughs> team group. Right. Uh, but yeah, so that's like seven books that you didn't write. Okay. Exactly. Uh, yes, uh, but you wrote on a number of topics. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, he wrote about the monsoon. He wrote about... Um, uh, vaccination against the polio across the world. Uh, he wrote something about the history of the guitar. Uh, and one, yeah, this one, you know, readers seem to like this one about the guitar, so I think you should read it if you don't know what to read. Uh, and there's also another book that you might find interesting if you're writing your MA dissertation or your, or your PhD dissertation. It's called uh, First Author. Also. Yeah, I'm getting to that. that. Okay, yeah. good deal. Yes. Thank you very much. But okay, oh, so then nice. He, he also wrote a book about endangered alphabets, and he's going to tell us about it. There you go. Thank you. Nobody has ever plugged my book, first time author, at one of these occasions. So this is this is great news. Okay, thank you so much for the You're for that welcome. encyclopedic and enthusiastic introduction. Yes, I sort of stumbled into this project because, as you said. Um, by background, I'm actually a writer and a guitarist rather than a woodworker or a linguist. Every person in this room has already forgotten more about linguistics than I, I know at all. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, what I'm working on right now, which is a series of projects, uh, collaborations, experiments, um, with the aim of uh, not just um, documenting or preserving, but uh, working with a variety of people to try and revive um, endangered uh, languages or endangered writing systems or um, both. So, um, and what I'm going to do is, uh, because as we were saying, this is an extraordinarily low-tech um, operation, um, I'm actually going to hold up some of these carvings and then pass them around. And my, my standard warning here is that unless you get out something very sharp and go like this, you're probably not going to damage them. But if you drop one on your foot, it may damage you. So for that reason, please be careful. Um, so uh, let's go back to the beginning. Um, in 2009, uh, Christmas was coming up, and I had no money. And... Um, I, I, I grew up in, in London and in uh, the Midlands. Um, I grew up very poor, and uh, we always made each other Christmas presents. And so I thought, I'll make my family you know, Christmas presents. And my then wife, um, who was a therapist, said, um, could I make her a sign um, to go hang outside her office? And I thought, um, I'll give it a try. Um, and so I went to the local wood shop and bought a piece of uh, what technically is called um, curly maple, which is um, a little bit like this. Um, this is, in fact, maple. This ripple effect here is what is called curly. This particular piece that I bought was about um, six feet long, um, and it had bark on both sides, what's called live edge. And I, I cut a piece off the end about this big, and I, I figured out that if I took her name and I blew it up and I used carbon paper, seriously, I went into the office supply shop and I said, there used to be this stuff called carbon paper. And they said, aisle one, seriously. 
is the worst sale they ever made because a pack of carbon paper has 100 sheets. I'm still using that same pack of carbon paper. Um, and so I transferred the name to the piece of wood and then I bought myself a set of hand gouges. So you can come up and look at these afterwards. Um, and started carving. And while I was doing this and just sort of learning as I went and basically cursing and trying not to stick the gouge through my hand, um, my older daughter came in and she uh, was in her senior year at the Rhode Island School of Design, which is a spectacular design school. And they have uh, um, uh, this great tradition that in your senior show, you actually have a table and you can sell your work. Uh, and she has a great business sense and she said, I want my table to stand out from everyone else's. Will you make me a sign too that says design by Zoe? And so I started working on hers. And then my younger daughter, who has no reason to have a sign whatsoever, and in fact was uh, 15 at the time, said she wanted a sign that said Maddie Brooks Fine and Performing Arts. You know, as if people who wanted to buy fine and performing arts would sort of stop by and, you know, and purchase some from her. Um, so depending on who was in the room, I would work on one or the other of these. And then I realized that my um, brother-in-law, who at the time lived down in the West Country, had a recording studio. He needed a sign. And then my other brother-in-law, who has a photo studio, he needed a sign. So it was like, that was it, Christmas. You know, everything was taken care of. Um, and uh, the way that all great ideas develop, of course, is by, you know, kind of naivety and ignorance and, and, and foolishness. And um, what happened next was um, I had really enjoyed doing this carving and the people who had been given these um, seemed to enjoy them as well. And after Christmas, we had a hole in the living room wall. This wasn't one of these, you know, someone punched a hole through the wall. I had actually built a sort of a niche to put a, um, a sound system in there and the sound system turned out to be awful. So there was just kind of a hole in the wall. And by chance, it happens to be more vertical than horizontal. And I thought, you know what? If I were in Manhattan, I would have like a little bud vase with an orchid in there or something like that. But instead, I thought, I'll do a carving and I'll see if I can sort of wedge it in there. And I thought, you know, it's, it's vertically aligned Chinese. Why not? And so I looked up the Chinese characters for House of Music and Art, and I carved those. And with a certain amount of sanding and swearing, I got those to fit in there. And it actually looked really good. Every so often, I'm going to say something that actually makes sense and is important. So I'll put my hand up just in case you actually need to know when these things are, because they're indistinguishable from everything else that I'm saying. Um, but the Chinese turned out to be uh, a really, really important for a reason that may not be apparent, and that is that when I had essentially been um, uh, copying various bits of typography in the Latin alphabet, what I realized was that it was a very mechanical act because the way we understand writing is actually very much based on um, Euclidean principles, lines should be parallel, there should be symmetry, there should be right angles. Um, it's it's uh, an alphabet of ideal forms, at least in, in, in the capital letters. And in Chinese, what I realized was that in the script itself, in the characters themselves, you see the drama of the act of writing you see where the brush hits the page and kind of goes pound, fattens out. You can see the movement of the wrist. And this means two things. It means that on the uh, one hand, it's not exactly that there are no such things as mistakes, but it's a much more forgiving script in that sense. And secondly, it's one that works much better with the movement of the wrist. And that was, although I didn't realize it, realize it at the time, when I started to begin to think about the difference between a typographic form and a script form, one that actually is an extension of the natural movements of the human body. 
So I really enjoyed um, this um, uh, Chinese carving, so I asked everyone I knew to come up with a monogram that they felt represented themselves. And then I would, um, I would cut off a piece from this rapidly shrinking um, piece of wood and I would, um, I would carve them a monogram and I would give it to them. And this project essentially ran out because first of all, I, I, there was, I, bless you, I had nobody else to give um, bits of wood with Chinese monograms on and secondly, the piece of wood I was using was getting smaller and smaller and the last one was actually about this big. So at that point I thought, I've really started to enjoy this, this carving thing. Bless you again. Um, but now I want to do something different because this is the next thing about how ideas develop. I am very easily bored. And so what I did was I had been in southern India um, on assignment for National Geographic. I had been in Kerala. And as, as some of you probably know, because you're all linguists, um, in, in Kerala, um, they have a language and a script called Malayalam. Um, and to my eye, when I, when I was there on assignment, I had never seen anything like this. It looked like a series of um, uh, enthusiastically bent paper clips. And I thought, I love that script. I'm going to um, see if I maybe carve something in that. And so I just, of course, I just Googled Malayalam, you know, and I found Omniglot.com. And many of you, I'm sure, uh, know this site already. If you don't know it, um, check it out. It is essentially an online encyclopedia of the world's writing systems. And as I was going through this, several things struck me. One was, I'm a pretty well-traveled person, but I had never heard of literally nine-tenths of these languages and scripts. Secondly, the variety and range of them, from a purely visual sense, was staggering. There are, there are some that um, were extraordinarily fluid, and there are others that were extraordinarily angular. And just the question of how writing systems should evolve in all of these different forms was sort of uh, completely new to me. The third thing was that as I'm reading about each of these scripts, what keeps coming up is no longer taught in schools, no longer used for official purposes, officially suppressed, um, only used in, um, say, um, uh, certain kinds of documents like maps maybe, um, only used by women to write secret love letters. So I'm going through this and I was also struck by the fact that there were relatively few Alphabets, I, and I, this is, I realize they're not all alphabets. This is kind of shorthand for writing systems. There are relatively few. There are, as we know, there are six or seven thousand languages in the world. There are probably, depending on how you define them, between about 100 and 140 writing systems. So that was also odd to me because these are the virtues of ignorance. I, I, this was new to me, and this was uh, it's like, well, really? So... In Omniglot, the example they use in most cases to show what a piece of text looks like in this writing system is Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, partly because the UN has been steadily um, translating this into a wide variety of languages. Interestingly, nobody at the UN thought, you know what, let's also use the traditional script of this culture. So in many cases, it's actually um, there in the Latin alphabet rather than, for example, the Balinese alphabet or the Javanese alphabet, something along those lines. Anyway, and of course, as you know, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, all people were created alike in dignity and respect. They were endowed with reason and conscience and, act toward, and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. And I thought this was a really interesting example in this context because on the one hand it's a very noble sentiment but on the other hand many of these scripts are endangered precisely because people don't behave towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood and so I thought um, I will try and carve article one 
in a number of these endangered scripts. Initially, just as a means of preserving them. I had no idea what I was really going to do with this. Except that I knew this was going to be an infinitely more ambitious project than anything I'd done in terms of carving before. And so I thought I need an incentive to keep going rather than just to give up halfway through. So I arranged at my college for an entire exhibition of artwork by faculty and students. And this was going to be in the middle, so I couldn't not do it. And I had no idea how long it would take me or how many of these I could do, so I set up this exhibition for 14 months down the road. And I thought maybe I might do eight. And in the end, I actually did um, 13. Um, and there was, you know, you know, there's no getting out of it. And so I cannot tell you the number of times um, you know, I would, uh, for example, I would be painting in this incredibly detailed and painstaking way. And by the end of the evening, I would have done like a word. And it was like, why did I decide to do this? Anyway, um, when that exhibition went up, two things happened that I wasn't expecting. One was uh, people came to me and said, this is important. I had essentially seen it as being like a pre-senile monomania. Um, you know, like people who go out to the garage and they make a scale model of Notre Dame with toothpicks, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, I just thought this was a sign that I was just kind of going batty, you know, in my corner. So the fact that people said, no, this is actually worthwhile was an immense relief. Um, the other thing that I wasn't expecting was that people said, this is art. And because I had no background as a visual artist, even though my mother is an artist and both my daughters are artists, I had kind of assumed this had just skipped a generation. Um, so this issue of someone saying this is art turns out to actually be really kind of important, hand up, because the fact that I wasn't, and I'm still not, a linguist, and so therefore I could not read or pronounce or know anything about the behavior of any of these languages or even individual letters meant that I was looking at them from a different point of view. I was looking at them from um, what technically is called an arsemic or asemic point of view. In other words, a purely graphic point of view, a point of view without meaning. So there's no phonetic content, there's no semantic content. I'm looking at it and I'm saying things like, why does this script look so mathematical? At that particular point, Canadian Aboriginal syllabics. Extremely um, mathematical type of script. Um, or for that matter, Tifina from uh, the Berber people in North Africa. Um, why does that look so blocky? It's extremely blunt. Why? Um, Babayan, um, the traditional um, pre-Spanish Filipino script, or one of them. Why is it so thin and so really, really hard to carve? Because it, it didn't make sense, you know? One of the things about writing is that it has to be functional. So therefore, the look of the script must have something to do with the way it's used or has been used or the technology that was used to develop it or is still used. So Tifana, for example, is often written in sand. If you're going to write in sand, you want a script that is as clear and bold as possible because otherwise it's going to be incomprehensible. There's also a tradition because there are a number of countries where the, the Berber people um, have been um, uh, rigidly and rigorously repressed. There's a tradition that um, if one person in a crowd wants to pass on a message to another in secret, you can do so by writing on the palm of their hand. Which again requires that it needs to be a very simple, very bold script. And it also, it also starts to hint at the fact 
that an endangered writing system may well be a kind of code. Um, in a distant way to the Navajo code talkers of World War II, I'm sure you, you all know about. I didn't know any of this, but the great thing about carving is it takes a long time. And so while you're doing it, you're thinking. Um, it's also a very interesting exercise because it slows language down at a time when we're all generally trying to speed language up. And as soon as that kind of bouleversement takes place, I'm not sure what the English word would be, for upheaval, overturning? Exactly, thank you. Um, when that takes place, you start asking different questions. You start seeing things from a different point of view. So, um, at that point, I started keeping a journal as I was carving that first um, exhibition and um, asking questions, many of which were occurring to me on a subliminal level. Now, that may sound like a kind of a, a woo-woo thing to say, but it's, this is so true. I'll give you an example. So, I was working on Samaritan. Okay, so Samaritan um, is... Um, a Semitic language, it's a close, it's a cousin, um, in fact, the, uh, the Samaritans refer to it as ancient Hebrew. Um, the Samaritans were once a numerous people, probably a million or more, um, but as a result of a series of um, uh, attacks and depredations, by the end of the 19th century, there were literally four families left. But, the Middle East being the Middle East, um, the sense of the need to survive and to, remain, to retain one's identity as a means of surviving, extraordinarily strong. And so even when there were only four families left, there was always a librarian, somebody whose job was to maintain the language and the script. So I'm carving this Samaritan stuff and the word that occurs to me as I'm carving it is gnarly. It is a strange script in that what was occurring to what occurred to me was that over time you would think that individual letters would be like stones in a stream. They would be sort of eroded and worn to a point where they have reached a kind of functional beauty, a kind of smoothness and, and, and kind of movement. And Samaritan is absolutely not like that. It looks like, each letter looks like part of a thorn bush. And um, as I was carving this, I kept on thinking Sherlock Holmes. And I had no idea why I was thinking Sherlock Holmes, but as I'm carving it, this, the phrase Sherlock Holmes kept occurring to me. And eventually I realized that it was because of the case of the dancing men. Okay, so those of you who know your Sherlock Holmes stories, case of the dancing men, right? There's basically, it's a cipher. One set of bad guys is communicating with another set of bad guys by drawing stick figures. And, and so, you know, there's this and there's this and there's this, you know, this kind of thing, right? And, but I couldn't figure out why I was thinking about the case of the dancing man until I realized that the Samaritan letters do not behave according to the laws of stability and symmetry. In other words, the bottom line may well, if there is an implied line, may well not be horizontal. They seem to be tipped and moving. And this really t shows two things, one about Samaritan and one about our own assumptions about writing. What it shows about Samaritan is the Samaritans believe that, their, that theirs is the original Hebrew, which means, ready for this, it is the handwriting of God. It is the script that Moses brought down from the mountain. And you don't mess with the handwriting of God. 
You don't sort of go, okay, let's have Curl's MT Samaritan. Let's have Joker Man Samaritan. You know, this is when I started realizing that how deeply connected um, scripts and traditions are, in fact. On the other hand, the fact that we believe and, and tend to um, enact the belief that writing should be symmetrical and stable is because um, our, um, our script traditions are heavily based on monuments, and specifically monuments to Greek and then Roman emperors, where the values that you want to embody are stability, permanence, reliability. They are the aesthetic values of a military empire. Permanence. So these are the things that I'm asking myself as I'm going through all of this. And, and all of this stuff um, turns up in my book, Endangered Alphabets. So now I'm going to skip over the next few years because I want to talk more about what it is I'm up to now. Over the next few years, I started looking into more writing systems. I also started looking more and more at individual letters or individual words because the more text you have, the more it tends to come across as a lump. And as an act of preservation, that makes a whole lot of sense. But in terms of the question of how does a script look the way it does or why, then that gets lost the more text you have. So I started looking more and more at individual letters, in particular and words. I also got really involved with um, a variety of cultures all over the world whose um, culture is essentially under siege or even um, being economically, politically or militarily suppressed. Um, this is in particular because um, I had been to Bangladesh. Um, I was there do actually doing some public health work. And I, yeah, come on in. Um, I asked ahead of time whether there were any endangered alphabets in Bangladesh. And what I discovered was there's an entire area of Bangladesh called the Chittagong Hill Tracts, which is home to 13 indigenous peoples. But the whole area is sealed off by the army. Um, and the government has, up until very recently, denied that Bangladesh has any indigenous people. Or, flip side, if there are any indigenous people, they are not Bangladeshi because they don't speak Bangla. And so they are denied a whole series of um, civic rights and human rights on this basis. So I met a guy. I had done some carving in some of these scripts. And I got contacted by a guy who was actually at the Graduate School of Education in Harvard. He was an ethnic marma, M-A-R-M-A, from the Chittagong Hill Tracts. And he was uh, the first people, first of the marma people, actually, to end up in the United States. He had then gone back to Bangladesh to start first one and now three mother language schools, so that um, the indigenous kids could be educated, at least in the first instance, in their own languages. And the reason for this was because officially education takes place in Bangla, which people in the hill tracks don't speak, not even as a second language. And so educationally, it's a disaster. Fewer than 2% of indigenous children in the hill tracks complete their education. Fewer than 2%. Dropout rate of 98%. Fewer than half are still in any form of education at the age of 11. And so what that means is they are essentially being brought up for a life of manual labor or prostitution. And this is part of um, an overt campaign to essentially ethnically cleanse that region. Um, before we start getting, especially I, before I start getting preachy about this, this is of course exactly what happened in the United States and in Canada with uh, residential schools in Canada, with um, reservation schools in the United States. It's 
uh, it's obviously something that has occurred and continues to occur all over the world. So I started working with him initially to do some carvings in these endangered scripts because when you carve something and put it on the wall, it, it attains two qualities. One, it becomes signage, and signage is authoritative. Most of these kids have never seen a sign in their own writing system, in their own language. And the second thing is, it becomes art, which means it gains respect, and people look at it differently. So first of all, I did some carvings, and then he and I began to work together on a project of which this is an example. So what happens in these schools is that... So these, these are schools with no resources. So when you see the kids, they're all sitting on the ground, right? We're not talking about tables and chairs. We're talking about, um, you know, kids. The first school was, in fact, a, a ruined um, Buddhist temple that had been burned by the military. And it became... Um, a boarding school where many of the parents paid for their kids' fees in food, um, in grain, you know, in barter. So um, what they started doing was asking the kids, go home to your village and ask your grandparents or your village elders to tell you a story they heard when they were a kid and, and bring that story back. So they would do that, and they would come back to the classroom, and then the kids would stand up in front of class and tell these stories. So, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, in the developing world, it's very, very unusual for kids to even be heard in the classroom, and certainly to take a position of authority in the classroom. Usually, in, in, in many of these schools, it's actually regarded as bad behavior for the child to look at the teacher. So for the kid to be in front of the classroom telling a story is a radical act in itself. So the storytelling was, was videotaped and the uh, it, uh, individual stories were selected um, by the teachers and then sent out actually to me and to my students at Champlain College in, in Burlington, Vermont. And so what we would do is... Um, uh, We would do editing and layout and design and illustration and then send them back for proofreading because, of course, we had no idea what we were doing. Um, and then when everything was, um, was okayed, we'd run a Kickstarter campaign, a, you know, crowdfunding campaign, um, and uh, publish these books. So typically what we would do is we would publish a small number in the United States which were used for fundraising purposes and then the PDFs were sent to India or Bangladesh where uh, more were printed at a, of course a much cheaper rate, shipping much cheaper so they could be used in the schools. So what you have then is validation, you have cultural validation. You know these are kids, <laughs> my friend who's from the Hill Tracks, when he was in school he was, his his education in terms of reading was to memorize William Wordsworth's poem, Daffodils. And of course, there are no daffodils in the Hill Tracts. And so he memorized the whole thing because they would be beaten if they made mistakes. But he had absolutely no idea what a daffodil was. So, um, and of course, this is part of the whole kind of cultural reinforcement. Um, it's sort of imperial education that is regarded as being education and literature in, in traditional Bangladesh education. So to have these kids reading a story in their own language that has the iconography of their own culture because the illustrations as much as possible were done um, with reference to Hiltrak's culture was really um, something pretty remarkable. Um, this um, language, by the way, is Mro. There are probably only about 20,000 Mro left. Um, uh, in order for us to get something translated into Mro, up until very recently, we had to email the text to somebody in Bandaban, which is the only town of any size in Hill Tracks, and then somebody would have to go off on foot for you know two days to get to a village where there was somebody who could still read and write in the Moreau script. 
Um, so this is when I started getting more and more involved in revival activities. Um, the, one of the next projects that we did was to uh, create a dictionary. And dictionaries are problematic in a wide range of reasons, and I'm sure you all know this stuff. Um, and in particular, one of the things that we wanted to avoid was the notion of a, just a sort of a, a two-way translation, you know, English to Chakma or uh, Bangla to Mro. And we also wanted to avoid a sense of um, cultural hierarchy. And so what we did, uh, and, and the final thing we wanted to do was to recognize that this is a, 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 a language community in the Hill Tracts. So if, for example, you're a Chakma, you speak Chakma in the home, but you also probably speak maybe Tripura and Mro as well to some extent, because it is a, a, the assumption is that these are people who um, live and work and transact, you know, in close proximity. And so to extract an individual language from that group sort of uh, does violence to the language fabric of the region. And so what we did was to um, get a bunch of, actually a hundred, um, illustrations, and then we circled the illustration with that word in Mro, Marma, Chakma, Tripura, Bangla, the national language, and English. Because, of course, there is also this question, if you have somebody who speaks um, a traditional or indigenous language, and that's the only language they're speaking by the end of their education, have you limited their ability to move and negotiate and transact with a greater community? Interestingly enough, slight aside here, there's some fascinating research coming out of mother language schools in Canada. So um, there are uh, a number of um, Inuit community schools um, in, in Quebec, um, and I think also in Ontario, where uh, what they do is they center the um, school within the community. And when I say within, I realize these are buzzwords. What they do is they make sure that the school is an extension of the home. And so traditional practices such as um, hunting, for example, are part of the activities of the school so that the kids can do those things with their parents or, or their uncles and aunts or, or whatever. So it, it, there's that sense of education as being something which happens naturally within any kind of family, then within a broader community, within a region. When the kids are a reach, I think it's the age of nine, it may be ten, they then transition to an English language school, um, by law in fact. What they've discovered is that of the children who are reading above grade level at the age of eleven, more than half are Inuit. So they're actually reading in their second language more successfully than kids who are reading in English as their first language. And there's all kinds of theories as to why this is. Um, and that's something which I can direct you to research on that. But what it really shows to show is that uh, mother language education um, first of all, is very important, but secondly, it's not a hindrance to then learning a broader national or, or regional um, language. Anyhow, so um, last summer, about this time last year, I sort of got hit by a thought that I was I'm really embarrassed that I, it never occurred to me before, which is that the even though I've just been talking about education, education is not the answer. Hang on just a second. And in order to explain what I mean, I need to introduce you to a phrase which those from the United States will understand very well, which is the phrase high school Spanish. Exactly, right. Now, pretty much everybody in the United States takes Spanish 
and nobody remembers a bloody word of it. So the phrase high school Spanish means I took it for two years and I do not speak it at all. Um, you know, I, 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 I may be able to make sounds, but that's about it. Anyway, so what I realized about a year ago is that if you want to revive a language, you have to start with kids. And if you want to start with kids, you have to create games. Because, and this is where I'm going to start um, pulling out a couple of these. So let's, con these carvings here are sort of faux Scrabble tiles. Each of them has a letter and a number. And each of, interesting enough, each of these um, scripts also has um, a traditional number system. Um, and in each case, um, they're also endangered. If you think about it, numbers are even more global than, uh, than scripts are. So um, I started thinking about Scrabble and the fact that Scrabble is an extraordinary um, exercise in uh, rehearsal. It means that it's not just a question of recognizing letters and recognizing words. It's, it's much more sophisticated than that. It means that we need to be able to recognize letter clusters and manipulate le letter clusters mentally in the same way that we do, you know, arithmetic in our heads. It means that we need to um, do extremely rapid and efficient movements through the liquid of, lang of written language. And we only do this well because we've done it often. And if you think about games that we've, we've played, you know, from childhood, Hangman, you know, everybody's played Hangman. And so you learn certain essentials about your um, language over and over again, and you have fun doing so. It's not as if in Bali, for example, in elementary school, everybody um, spends a year learning the traditional um, language and script, but it's like high school Spanish. After that, nobody does it, it's gone. You know, you can fire a cannon down a street in Bali and not hit anybody who can still read and write their traditional script, which is this one, by the way, which I personally find extraordinarily beautiful. Um, the other thing about Scrabble is that the fact that Scrabble is available in a commercial form in a number of different scripts, um, I don't know how many, um, is a sign of how the, the world is moving towards um, a kind of functional minimal range of writing systems. In the same way that Facebook now supports, I think it is maybe 16 different writing systems, but many of my Facebook friends or people in Facebook groups, if they write to me, it just comes out in tofu squares because that's not a script that's you know, supported. Um, the fact that many keyboards, for example, um, don't support uh, you know, more than a sort of a functional minimum of um, scripts means that on the one hand, it looks as if we're globalizing um, and we're respecting a diversity. But in practice, what's happening is that there's a shrinkage that's taking place down to this sort of transactional um, uh, um, critical mass. Um, so I thought what I'll do is I will start creating games in endangered alphabets. And Scrabble was the first one I thought about. And it was a disaster. <laughs> Scrabble is not a good idea. So, and, and I got completely fooled. Some, one of my contacts in Java had created in CorelDRAW a picture of a Scrabble board with a series of tiles in Javanese. And I think, this is amazing. He's ahead of me. He's doing all this stuff already. I need to catch up and, and, and see what other scripts I can use. But here's the thing, in many of the world scripts, especially those in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and you know, further across that sort of Brahmi sweep, um, the scripts essentially, the way they indicate vowels is by modifying, is either by having syllables or by modifying consonants. 
And so um, uh, instead of having a, an alphabet of a small number of letters, like we do, and have those letters be extremely flexible in terms of how they're pronounced, you actually have a system whereby you have a much larger number of characters, each of which is much more specific in the way it's pronounced. But it means that you would have to have like 70 or 80 different tiles in order to have a Scrabble set, which is just completely impractical. And so I contacted this guy and I said, you know, I've been working on this now for, for months trying to figure out how you've done it. How did you create a Javanese Scrabble game? He said, oh, it can't be done. That was just an art project. <laughs> exactly. You also have a situation in, for example, Mongolian. So Mongolian is a fascinating script because it is inherently calligraphic. So in Mongolian, every letter has three forms depending on where it appears in the word. So if it is an initial position, then it has one of a series of really kind of interesting swoops that kind of leads into the, the word. If it's in the middle of the word, it has really simple functional characteristics like a, a spike here or a loop. But if it appears at the end of the letter, once again, there is this wonderful kind of flourish quality to it. And so it's a vertical script. Again, if you were to try and do a Scrabble game in Mongolian, you would need three versions of each letter, which once again produces like a completely unmanageable series of um, tiles. So instead, what I've been doing since then is working on a couple of other things. So here, well, actually, some of you, I gave out these postcards. We have jigsaw puzzles um, with each of these. This is, in fact, Marma, uh, very similar to the uh, Burmese alphabet. Um, so the kids in the Chittagong Hill Tracks now have jigsaw puzzles um, where they can uh, make mango, storm, leaf, and a number of others. Um, but the thing about jigsaw puzzles is you lose one piece and, you know, it's, the whole thing is destroyed. Um, so I've been trying a number of other approaches. This is, as far as I know, the first Endangered Alphabets board game. Um, so I was at a conference last year in Barcelona and a guy from uh, Bulgaria came over to me and he said, uh, do you think you could create a game um, that uses the glagolitic alphabet, which was, as I'm sure many of you know, one of two alphabets created by Greek missionaries to write uh, old church Slo Slavonic as they were moving up through the Balkans and Eastern Europe towards Russia, the other being Cyrillic. And he said, you know, I would love to start a revival of the glagolitic alphabet, which, small sidestep, the glagolitic alphabet came as close to extinction as any other that has ever uh, um, been created as far as I know. So it was used um, uh, ecclesiastically um, uh, quite widely up until around 12 or 1300 and then less and less and less until eventually by 1980 say it was only being used on a regular basis by two priests on the island of Kruk and they were so conservative that even the notion of a Latin mass was too you know newfangled for them they were they were still using glagolitic which also meant that when a fisherman bought a new boat, he would have the name of the boat written on the boat in glagolitic, because of course it's the Holy Script, it implies divine protection. So as we got towards 1990, the two priests died. And so you would think, right, that's it, end of, end of glagolitic. And glagolitic was saved by the most peculiar um, occurrence 
namely the Yugoslav Civil War. So, as you know, early 1990s, um, Yugoslavia, Tito dies, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia begins to fall apart. We have an extremely bloody conflict which takes place for several years. When the dust settles, the entire region, which depends very heavily on tourism, has an image problem, which is that it, a particular new country, for example, may be widely known as, oh yes, that's the country whose former military leader is now on trial in The Hague for crimes against humanity, like very bad press. And so Croatia decided in this stroke of genius to kind of give this visual sense of historical legitimacy by including glagolitic script in its um, uh, tourism materials. So it sort of implies visually all of this recent nonsense is, is nothing to do with us. You know, we've been here for centuries. We are this ancient nation um, and everything is fine. You, there's actually a park called Glagolitic Park where you can walk between large sculptures of the individual Glagolitic letters. Anyhow, so my friend I made in Barcelona said, make me a game that revives Glagolitic. And so here we have the board game Glagolitic Abbey, um, which you're all invited to come up and have a look at afterwards. Essentially, it's, it's a board game in which you're looking for treasure in a Bulgarian abbey in the year 1200 um, and fighting the other people who are looking for the treasure. And in order to advance, you have to collect letter cards, each of which has a glagolitic letter on it. And the, the, the conceit of the game is that each monk in his cell is entrusted with one letter that he studies and meditates on for the, for the rest of his life. And you have to persuade the monks to give you their letters one by one, and that eventually reveals where the treasure is. So, good news is, this is now in Bulgaria being test driven by Bulgarians. And they're going to have their hands full, A, making sure the game actually works, and B, translating my jokes into Bulgarian, because it's full of jokes. It's going to be a hard one. The other thing that I'm doing is creating playing card games. Um, so we've now done uh, five different um, scripts. These are, this one is Chakma from the Chittagong Hill Tracks. This is Cree. Um, my Cree contacts are in uh, Eastern Canada. Um, and uh, I've created a number of um, playing card games that can be played by, you know, children or adults of various levels and ages. Again, the idea being that it's got to be something that's fun, it's got to be something that's easy, um, relatively cheap, easy to ship. Um, and as uh, mother language schools are, are developing, um, then I'm trying to work with them to give them classroom materials because, of course, the problem is that, A, there are very few people who speak or can teach many of these languages, and B, the government is certainly not going to provide educational classroom materials in these languages. Um, similarly, in the region where I live in Vermont, the indigenous people are the Abnaki. Um, there is only one person who can teach Abnaki, only one. There are something in the order of five to 10,000 people who trace Abenaki ancestry. Most of them cannot read and write Abenaki. Most of them can't speak Abenaki. Um, and so what I've started doing is things like, and in fact, this is so dire that most, most people don't know there are any Abenaki left at all. And so I created this postcard that I hand out all over the place, um, which says we are still here in Abenaki because their first goal, this is kind of interesting for you as linguists, is not to try and revive their language, but simply to let people know they actually still exist. The other thing that we did is that we had a look at their artwork. They don't have their own writing system, but they have strong artwork traditions. And my graphic designer and I created a font based on their artwork styles. 
And so they are now, as far as I'm aware, only the second Native American people to have their own custom font. So um, I'm now doing a series of carvings for the various tribal headquarters around the state that, says, that say, we are still here. And I've done a carving um, uh, which says, uh, people of the dawn, which is what Abenaki means, um, that is going up in the Vermont State House later this year and will be the first visual or visible representation of the existence of the Abenaki in the State House. Um, so that's what I'm working on. And I will pause now and take questions. Now, actually, before I do that, I want to make a pitch. So, um, All of this um, work that I'm doing is essentially um, funded out of my own pocket. I've created a nonprofit um, to do all this stuff. Um, I'm retiring from my day job um, this year. And so, um, painful though it may be, I have to give a financial pitch anywhere I go to say, please support what's going on here if you're interested. And you can do this in a number of different ways. Um, you can go to endangeredalphabets.com and buy a copy of the book, Endangered Alphabets. Um, periodically, typically once a year, I run a Kickstarter uh, crowdfunding campaign. Um, and um, I'm also um, out soliciting sponsorships from um, translation companies and to my um, astonishment and delight, um, individual people um, make donations which they can do again through the endangeredalphabets.com website. Um, what I'm going to do is to put this at the back and invite you, um, if you're interested in staying in touch, to put your name and email on here. Um, I'm going to park this right here so you can see it on the way out. And now I will take questions. Go for it. And first of all, tell me your name. Anmarsh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that I used to have an, an Arabic scrabble, which also has different initial, middle, and final forms, right? So they, they kind of, I don't know what, how they did it, but they just like, wanted forms in order to create words. Because you said about the middle that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I do not know how they would have done that. I think scrabble is, I know scrabble. Yes, it's in at least a dozen scripts, and apparently they're open to others. So this is more of a symbolic gesture than a kind of to scrabble. Very interesting. I, I'll look into that. Nice live research. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, one of my favorite script is um, Sinhala from Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm amazed at how many of the letters actually look like those really uncomfortable chairs, like Italian modernist chairs from made in like 1960 that you couldn't sit on comfortably, you know. And so um, I've done a bunch of carvings in Sinhala just because I, I want to, you know. And I discovered that they have a really interesting number system, which is not strictly decimal. Um, uh, because, you know, are you going to have a, a different character for, say, um, a thousand and five thousand, you know, this kind of stuff. And it turns out to be an endangered number system because the pressure on um, uh, international commerce or computing or whatever, all of it implies, you know, I'm going to pass these out. I promised I would pass these out and I never did. So there you go. Um, uh, uh, that is the, the sort of the commercial uh, pressures on simplification of numbers are even greater than they are on simplification of, of letters or universalization of numbers and letters. Other questions? Yeah, go for it. You're 
Yeah, oh, yes, 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 yes. No. Not really, not really used much, or otherwise, as you say, another language. Yes, absolutely. And um, Saleti is, is really interesting because, um, again, it's another script, um, it's, it's another sort of Bangladeshi script that, even though Bangladesh was founded on the principle of, of mother tongue because of the, you know, the, the civil war with West Pakistan, no sooner had uh, Bangladesh or East Pakistan achieved independence, then it immediately said, this is going to be our official um, mother, uh, Bangladesh is going to be our official language, and um, any regional or minority or indigenous languages and scripts simply don't, and not only they don't count, they don't exist. Um, and, and so my friend from the Hill Tracts um, uses this phrase that I'm sure you've heard before, which is how quickly the oppressed become the oppressors. Um, so, you know what? I should be passing these out with their handy little car, shouldn't I? Yes. Because right, nobody knows what these are, otherwise they wouldn't be in danger. Okay, there's yours. Okay. Which... Oh. Hang on a second. Let me give me just a second. I want to catch up so that you know what is going with which. Okay, this one goes with that. This one goes with that. Thank you. Yes, your question. Okay, so, um, so you mentioned about schools and the kids. Um, I know this comes up again and again. And it's Yes, so let me, let me clarify what I was saying. Um, I think what I'm saying is that, yes, the issue of, of teachers is obviously vital. Um, in, in Cherokee, they talk about relearners because there are so few people who've spoken Cherokee continuously since birth that it's really people who are committed to the language and the culture who've relearned it, who are passing, usually very humbly, what they've relearned on. Same true with, with Abnaki. I think the distinction that I was looking at was if all you produce for those teachers and for those role models is stuff which is clearly school material, then what it's not doing is making its way out into the community. So what I'm really uh, ideally doing is I would love to be able to do stuff that actually goes home, so that in the home they are using the playing cards, because it's actually often the parents' generation that is the, the one that is most impoverished. Quite often the grandparents' generation, they have actually been speaking throughout um, so my question then is, is how are we going to get it out into the hands of people who are going to use it over and over again, irrespective of the resources of the local school? So I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you in the slightest. Okay, the first thing is the language has to leave school. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Yes. Okay. Next one. Okay, other questions? Yes. Yes. Have you looked into that? Because it just seems that a lot of different scripts, the, the way that they're formed, the letters, the shapes, would, are a lot determined by... Exactly. The yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Exactly. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, also, don't leave without getting some postcards. You get some postcards. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is very true. And in fact... Um, I couldn't, I asked the question, why, is the, why are the strokes in Babayan so thin and so hard to carve? And there are two interesting things I discovered. One is that it's because um, traditionally Babayan was incised with the point of a knife in bamboo. And so it's going to be extremely thin, which is going to affect 
a bunch of things. Um, first of all, it means that that's actually really hard to read. So what they would do is they would take a handful of ash from the fire and rub it into the incised letter so it would stand out more. And the other was that this was a script that they probably inherited from further south, maybe from the, the Bugis people. But because they were using a palm leaf script, the, you often get a character which essentially is like a boomerang with a dot underneath it. You cannot do a dot with the point of a knife because it would be impossible to see. It would be so small. And so it got replaced by a cross, um, which is, you know, more distinct. The other thing is that what this also means, and this goes back to your technology question, is that it's actually really dangerous. Like if you have a round, hard uh, wood like bamboo, and you're working with the tip of a knife, the chances of you, you know, cutting open your own wrist are pretty good. And so what they would do is they would hold the bamboo away from themselves at an angle, which makes perfect sense, right? When the first anthropologists studied this, they assumed bam that uh, babine was a vertical script because of the way the bamboo was being held. But it's actually a horizontal script plus physical safety. So yes, the technology issue turns out to be enormously influential. Other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I feel enlightened. Uh, oh. Things, uh, I feel uh, embarrassed to say it's fellow of the Charter Institute of Linguists. Uh, some things I've never heard until today. Do, don't assume that I know what I'm talking well, about. I may do, but it's, it's not a guarantee. Yeah. Not about linguistics, but about culture, peoples, and, uh, and so on. Especially these Abbey, who were like the American Indians in your group? Um, can, I write it? can I write up here? Abenaki. A B E N A K I. Yes, I'm ignorance. The other thing I didn't know about, I know uh, that uh, hundreds of languages have become extinct since the occupation, call it uh, colonization mm -hmm. of these continents of uh, Americas, uh, Africa, and Asia. And Australia. And Australia, yeah. Uh, and uh, which is more important, that's bad enough. Uh, but uh, script, I didn't know that they had their own scripts, the American Indians. Uh. So, um, most did not. One of the great intellectual adventures of all time was um, the invention or the creation of a Cherokee script by Sequoia at the beginning of the 19th century, because at the time the widespread belief was that writing was a form of witchcraft. So, so, not, so, so most Native American peoples did not have their own writing systems. It's not indigenous, uh, old uh, script. It's Correct. a new, new invention. Correct. Right. Um, and in fact, that is also um, echoed in, uh, especially in West Africa, where there are a number of, so to speak, anti-colonial or post-colonial scripts that were created specifically to give... Um, a people their own writing system as opposed to that of the, the, the colonial um, overlords. Yeah, which brings me to the question of the writing systems of the Mongolians, mm. as your colleague mentioned. Uh, I didn't know they had their own specific uh, writing system, and obviously they had the language, <laughs> peoples have the language and their culture. Uh, and as you mentioned, it's written elliptically, yes. which is similar to how Chinese is written. Yeah, script is written. And you also mentioned, what well, you mentioned that the letters change their form, initial, medium, and the final, exactly yes, which is the same in Arabic as well. Which yep. looks something like that. If you want yes. to have a look at it. Yes. <laughs> uh, so. Was that also indigenous writing system, or have they been influenced by the Muslim Arabs and the Chinese? 
and therefore they have uh, this system. If it is Arabic based, why is it written? Yes. If it Arabic is written horizontally. Yes. Yeah. Above it. Right. So, so some go above, some go below, and some stay uh, right. at the same level. So that, that's one of the uh, other questions. And in general, <laughs> if I may <laughs> carry on, uh, is uh, obviously you're aware of the endangered languages. Yes. Organization. Are you in contact with them? Are you? Because alphabet is important. But language is even important. You can write any language in any alphabet, and the peoples who speak it are even more important than the language. But all of them are important, and none of them should become extinct. Yes. Uh, and you said you contacted the translation companies and all that. These are all commercial <laughs> entities, as it were. Have you contacted? Uh, Chart Institute of Linguists, Institute of Translation and Interpreting, and this time it would be more out of thought understanding uh, of your uh, cause, which is very commendable. Okay, so I counted nine questions there. <laughs> okay, so going through them backwards in order, yes. Um, it, there's no doubt that I've, uh, I've worked with a variety of people and organizations and companies and the reason why I'm going after translation companies is specifically commercial because I, I want money for them. So the playing cards are sponsored by a, a translation company. But I'm also working with a variety of people who are either individuals or members of organizations um, who are working to revive uh, or preserve their own um, language, their own culture. And I totally agree with you that, you know, the people are, are more important, put it that way, rather more important. Um, I say, yes, well, what I say is that um, uh, in the endangered uh, Alphabets are a subset of endangered languages, which are a subset of endangered cultures. Um, and uh, preserving or reviving language is one of the ways of helping to reinforce a sense of cultural identity, but it's not the only one. What were the other questions? Um, Mongolian? Um, Mongolian was adapted from an older writing system, I believe around 1200. Um, it spread west with um, the great Khan. And interestingly enough, okay, another quick um, sidestep here. So this is what my life has become. This is how strange my life has become. I got a, an email from a guy who is Kalmyk. Okay, Kalmyk. K-A-L-M-Y-K. So the Kalmyks are the last descendants of the Mongols at their furthest point west. So when the Mongols, as you know, um, made it all the way to the borders yes. of Europe, yeah. yes, exactly. So over the course of the next several centuries, they retreated, there were various places where they were overthrown, but in a small area, near the Caspian Sea, there was a group of Mongols who survived um, and uh, their, they, their, their word for themselves was Kalmyk and they still write, or a few of them still write, in the Todobichig vertical traditional Mongolian style. And they practice Tibetan Buddhism. They are the only nation in Europe whose dominant religion is Tibetan Buddhism. During the Second World War, when Hitler drove south through the Romanian oil fields and then back up towards Russia, the Kalmyks were right in the way. And some fled east into Russia, and some fled west, and some of those who fled west ended up in New Jersey. Which is actually an extraordinarily um, complex linguistic um, uh, environment. And they brought Tibetan Buddhism to the United States. So the first um, celebrants of Tibetan Buddhism in the United States were descendants of the Mongols. 
And this guy emailed me and he said, I'm coming up to Vermont with my family to go skiing over New Year's. Do you want to meet up in the Sheraton Hotel and have a drink on New Year's Eve? And so I spent New Year's Eve in this kind of stupid, ridiculous, gold-painted chairs ballroom at the Sheraton Hotel in South Burlington with a Kalmyk family who are telling me about their efforts to publish children's books in Kalmyk, in, in Toto Bichik. Um, so that's, that's the kind of exciting life I live these days. Very interesting. Um, there isn't anybody else, may I? <laughs> uh, carry on. Uh, uh, two more. Uh, Actually, one. there's, there's, a, there's a, a question or comment coming from behind you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah just yeah, things that you're making me think of as, as you're speaking, is kind of something else I was thinking about earlier. Because I, I too uh, was in India earlier this year um, in, in my sort of conference and workshop. Um, and one of the people in that workshop was actually working on uh, uh, um, endangered number systems. Um, oh, really? I would love to. That sounds fascinating. And the other thing, of course, is that there is a theory, this comes back to another of your questions, I think it was question three, that in fact, um, Mongolian is actually the Devanagari script turned through 90 degrees. So it's actually this. Exactly, they went through 90 degrees, and in, in Greek, actually also 180 degrees. But um, yes, uh, when I first saw this, I thought, no wonder this is, you know, the, the writing system of Genghis Khan. It looks like a series of weapons, you know, it's all these stabbing things. But actually, if you turn it through 90 degrees, it actually um, has a very strong um, similarity to the, uh, especially the, you know, the, the northern South Asian Devanagari scripts. Yes, go ahead. So my, my other point that kind of really that is that one thing I learned when I was in India is that um, in India they just get a language or proper language unless it has its own script. So they are still busy creating new scripts that are only invented old ones. Yes! And that brings us to the amazing work of Dr. Prasanna Shri, who maybe was at that conference. So in India, the degree, as you say, the degree of snobbery is toxic. They have this word tribal, which essentially means primitive. Yes, exactly. So Dr. Prasanna Shri, um, who's at the University of Andhra Pradesh, what she does is she goes to um, a hill tribe, because of course, the most conservative areas linguistically are always in the hills, right? And um, she says, uh, what is a culturally iconic image for this particular people? So let's say it's the tamarind tree, which is used for shade and for wood and for fruit and you know, all of these things, right? And so she will create a stylized tamarind tree and then create a writing system based on that kind of central iconic image so that the, even the visual look of this writing system feels like, yeah, this is who we are, this is what we do. And um, you're absolutely right, the sense that they are a more proud and legitimate people once they have their own writing system is apparently universal. Obviously, I'm taking her word for it, but it, it, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. There's all sorts of things you need to know about writing before you can do that. Um, uh, 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 the orthographic systems, whether it's going to be a celebrated architect or Absolutely. Of how the language works. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think what she's doing is um, not only intellectually, but also physically heroic in a variety of ways. Okay, other, uh, let's do one more question. What the heck? It's a short one. If I may say. No, no, I'm saying a short one. Uh, okay. Uh, examples you give of uh, Bangladesh, and if I might also add, uh, they're really called Mandic, or we call it Mandaic? Mandaic. Yeah. In the case of uh, uh, Bangladesh, these hill people, uh, well, are they different ethnically as well as linguistically? Are they Indic people or are they more Chinese or why is that? 
Urdu was always only ever a minority language, even when, even in West Pakistan. Yes. So, um, in the hill tracts, there are 13 genetically distinct groups. Some of them have more in common linguistically and or genetically with the Burmese. Um, some of them actually have uh, actually moved back and forth across the border with Myanmar, either on a seasonal basis or because they're being pursued by military or a variety of, of reasons. Um, some ha have uh, more in common with, for example, the state of Tripura in India, which is also just across the border. Um, so um, uh, I don't know their history going back, you know, more than a few generations. Interesting enough, when the British had colonized that area, they were very content to let, um, to let these people largely be self-governing. Um, and so I've seen um, books in Chakma and Marma from the 19th century. Um, books, uh, I've seen a collection of proverbs, for example, collected by a British anthropologist. There was, there was more of a sense of um, uh, recognition and tolerance within the overall colonial umbrella than there has been subsequently, which is, um, I would say, um, something that deserves to be remedied. Anyway, that's just me. Thank you so much for your questions and your attention and all those other things. And do feel free to come up and, and play with these things and take postcards and sign up on the um, sheet. And um, enjoy the rest of your day, as they say.